Hearing dark stories in a podcast is one thing, but living in darkness is quite another. If you're living with depression and trying to deal with it using alcohol, illegal drugs, or other bad influences, please pick up the phone right now and get help. 800-831-1560. Every 12 minutes, someone dies of an overdose. Every 6 minutes, from alcohol abuse. Call 800-831-1560. With the FMLA, you can even take a leave of absence from your job and still keep it. 800-831-1560. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It was one of those moments, like when President Kennedy died, that are so momentous that everyone remembers where they were when they heard the news. That moment, in the early hours of the 31st of August, 1997, shook the world. Princess Diana, her companion Dodi Fayed, and driver Henry Paul had died in a car crash at the Alma Tunnel in Paris. The world initially blamed the paparazzi widely believed to have forced Diana's car into a high-speed chase through the streets of Paris, a chase that ended in tragedy as the car hit a pillar in the Alma Tunnel at an estimated 110 kilometers per hour. This was an all-too-convenient narrative. The paparazzi, despised by celebrities and public alike, were easy scapegoats for the tragedy and the image that they'd hounded the princess to her death stuck with the public almost immediately. Princess Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, summed up the public mood at her funeral, where he described her as the most haunted person in the modern age. However, as the years rolled by and calls for an official inquest into the deaths grew stronger, it became apparent that the paparazzi weren't responsible for Diana's death. Indeed, they weren't even present when the car crashed. After years of campaigning by the press and Dodi Fayed's father, Mohammed Al-Fayed, who had made several lurid allegations of murder involving MI5 and the royal family, the inquest into the accident got underway in 2007, headed by Lord Justice Scott Baker. Exceeding 12.5 million pounds and extending to over six months, the inquiry interviewed 250 witnesses and considered hundreds of pieces of evidence. It concluded that Diana had been unlawfully killed by the following vehicles, never identified, exacerbated by her driver Henry Paul being drunk. But many troubling details uncovered at the inquests cast serious doubt that the crash was just a tragic accident. Could it be that Diana was really murdered? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you have a dark tale for me to tell, fact or fiction, you can share it with me at WeirdDarkness.com. And if you're new here, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… On November 1, 1918, the deadly Malbone Street disaster took place in Brooklyn, and it remains today as the worst wreck in the history of New York City's subway system. But first, were Diana, Princess of Wales, and Dodi Fayed murdered in a staged car accident? We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness.
The official narrative of Diana's death has the passengers, Princess Diana, her companion Dodi Fayed, the driver, Henry Paul, and bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones attempting to discreetly leave the Paris Ritz by the back entrance in order to avoid the throng of paparazzi waiting outside. However, Paul's odd behavior on the night contradicts this. He is seen on CCTV reportedly exiting the back door in the hours preceding their departure and talking to paparazzi to inform them when they planned to leave. Moments before Diana and Dodie are led to their car, Paul signals the waiting photographers. The paparazzi themselves found this behavior highly unusual. If the group had wanted to avoid the waiting press, why was Paul trying his best to attract their attention? Paul himself had a mysterious background. The inquest uncovered evidence linking him to arms dealers and various intelligence agencies, including Britain's MI6. One uncorroborated report had him meeting his MI6 handler on the night of the crash. Whatever the truth, unusually large amounts of cash were found in Paul's possession after his death and over 170,000 pounds were found deposited across 15 different bank accounts. Within hours of the crash, even before his autopsy, news was leaked to the press that Henry Paul was drunk as a pig and this had contributed to the crash. However, the official inquest found he had only had two alcoholic drinks that entire day, and several witnesses said he showed no visible signs of being drunk, something backed up by the CCTV from the Paris Ritz. The idea that he had a drinking problem also appeared in the press, from where it's not been established. But all the evidence suggests he was no more than a moderate social drinker. In fact, he'd recently become a qualified pilot, which includes tests for alcohol abuse, and his liver was shown to be normal and healthy at the autopsy. After the autopsy, Henry Paul's blood was found to contain more than three times the legal limit for alcohol under French law. This more than anything sealed the story in the minds of the public. Princess Diana and Doty died in a car accident because their driver was hopelessly drunk. But this picture is undermined by the official inquest, which repeatedly questioned the veracity of Henry Paul's blood samples. Numerous problems were found. Samples disappear. They have the wrong dates on them. They contain several drugs that Paul was not known to take, and his blood, most confusing of all, contained incredibly high levels of carbon monoxide that none of the pathologists could explain. The readings were so high that Paul would have felt noticeably and violently ill, something nobody who was with Paul that night observed. Several experts who gave evidence at the inquest, including Professor Peter Vanessis, a professor of forensic medicine, and Dr. John Oliver, a toxicology expert, simply couldn't believe the levels found in the samples could be correct. Ethel Johnston, a professor of pharmacology, said, the most likely explanation is that it isn't Henry Paul's blood, it's someone else's. We have gone through all the other ones. Even the judge at the inquest appeared to doubt the samples were from Paul. He told the jury, too much emphasis is placed on assumptions that the blood being tested was from Henry Paul. The jury will have to consider if wrong samples got into the bottle or there was a deliberate mix-up. Were Paul's samples deliberately swapped to support the false idea he was drunk? Suggestively, researchers found one of the other bodies in the morgue that night was of a suicide victim who killed themselves via carbon monoxide poisoning. Contrary to popular belief, the Mercedes had long since pulled away from the pack of chasing paparazzi who didn't catch up until at least a minute after the crash but multiple witnesses describe other vehicles buzzing around Diana's car as it sped towards the tunnel. There are reports of high-powered motorcycles encircling the car, and paint found on the crashed vehicle was forensically matched to a white Fiat Uno Turbo, indicating a collision between them. No CCTV was available in the local area, and the vehicles have to this day never been identified. Unlike the paparazzi, who arrived after the crash and stayed at the scene taking photos, the drivers of these vehicles left the tunnel immediately. 
What role did they play in the crash and why did they flee the scene? One witness, Francois Lavistre, claimed to have seen a bright flash of light as a motorbike swerved in front of the Mercedes, causing it to lose control. Whilst an assassination scenario in this fashion may seem far-fetched, ex-MI6 intelligence officer Richard Tomlinson told the official inquest he'd seen plans to kill Slobodan Milosevic in exactly this manner by staging a car crash using a powerful strobe light to disorient the driver. Forensic investigation of the crash site concluded a white Fiat Uno collided with Diana's car inside the tunnel, possibly causing the crash. Whilst none of the official investigations ever traced either the car or its owner, private investigators for Dodi Fayed's father claimed to have traced the car to a paparazzi called James Andenson, a millionaire photographer who had been following Diana all across Europe in the days leading up to the crash. Andenson, a colorful character with a shady background, owned a white Fiat Uno, and investigators found it had recently undergone repairs for a broken taillight. Was Andenson's car in the tunnel that night? Andenson, allegedly an MI6 informant, had been blabbing to his friend, crime writer Frederick Dard, that he was in the tunnel that night and had photos of the crash. But whilst most of the evidence against him is circumstantial, Andenson's strange fate has convinced many of his involvement. In 2000, he drove 400 miles from his home to a remote piece of woodland. He doused himself in 20 liters of petrol, secured his seatbelt, and, choosing the most unlikely form of suicide possible, set fire to the car from the inside. His body was found not much more than a charred crisp, with what was left of his arms peacefully crossed in the driver's seat. It's hard to imagine just how horrendous burning to death would be, and equally hard to imagine how anyone could remain still whilst in such horrific agony. But it got stranger. Andenson had somehow managed to lock himself into the car from the outside, the keys nowhere to be found. And when fireman Christopher Pellet attended the smoking shell of the car, he was certain there were two bullet holes in Andenson's skull. The official verdict was, improbably, suicide. Andenson had set fire to himself in a car locked from the outside and then, whilst on fire, shot himself in the head. A scenario so unlikely that it can be realistically discounted. In 1993, Diana sent a handwritten note to her butler, Paul Burrell, which read, "'This particular phase in my life is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury.'" Later, in 1995, Diana's lawyer, Lord Mishkan, made a note of a conversation with her in which she predicted she would be got rid of in an accident in her car such as a pre-prepared brake failure or by other means. Ms. Khan was so concerned by this note that after her death he forwarded it to the Metropolitan Police. The police did nothing with the note and kept its existence secret until it was revealed in 2003. Many critics of conspiracy theories surrounding Diana's death have commented on the unreliability of assassination by car crash. Diana and Dodie's plans for that evening changed multiple times, with many possible routes to Dodie's flat from the Ritz. How could the plotters know when and where to prepare their ambush? And even if they did, how could they be sure that they would succeed in causing a fatal crash? Whilst none of the occupants of the car were wearing seatbelts, the conspirators could neither know or control this. With this and so many other variables outside of their control, it seems an unlikely method for a professional hit. One undisputed fact is a white Fiat Uno was involved in the crash. The Uno, a lightweight, small-engined city car, would be no match for Diana's large, powerful Mercedes. Would a state or intelligence service orchestrated assassination choose a vehicle so unsuitable for forcing a Mercedes off the road? What was the motive for the state, royal family, or intelligence services to murder Diana? 
Many of the claims surrounding the former princess that have provided a motive have been shown to be false. Contrary to Muhammad al-Fayed's allegations, she was not pregnant with Dodi's child. Diana had only known Dodi for a few weeks and friends thought the relationship was not serious. The specter of a Muslim father-in-law or half-brother for their heir to the throne seems too remote to warrant a risky murder plot. And with Diana no longer a princess and effectively ostracized from the royal family, what other threat to them was she aside from her ability to court headlines? Some conspiracy theories suggest Diana was murdered because of her anti-landmine campaigns, but the murder of such a prominent landmine campaigner would surely provide an extra impetus to the cause, and indeed her death was the catalyst behind the signing of the Ottawa Treaty in December 1997, banning the weapon. Up next, on November 1, 1918, the deadly Malbone Street disaster took place in Brooklyn, and it remains today as the worst wreck in the history of New York City's subway system. When Weird Darkness Returns You've heard me talking about my pillow for a while now. Well, I bought a memory foam mattress a few years ago, thinking that it would be more comfortable for me, and it was for a while but if I'm in bed for too long, it really hurts my back, to the point that I can barely walk the next morning. Um, I was to the point I had to sleep in shifts just to give my back a rest. But somehow, and I'm not sure why, but placing the MyPillow mattress topper on top of the memory foam has completely eliminated my back aches. I wake up with zero pain now, and that is the best way to start the day. But if you've never tried any of the MyPillow products, now is the perfect time to investigate because they're offering four pillows at once, two premium and two go-anywhere pillows all together for one low price. And you can get free shipping if you use the promo code WEIRD. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the four-pack special, and enter promo code WEIRD for free shipping. My biggest issue when it comes to losing weight is I have no discipline. None. If I get a craving for something, I can't help myself. I have to satisfy the craving. But I'm trying something new now. No food after 6 p.m. Easier said than done, right? Well, that's my junk food monster time. Your time for daily cravings might be different. Well, fortunately, I found this CBD oral spray, and it has been a big help, at least to me. Whenever I get this unhealthy food craving in the evening, I can keep it at bay with a few sprays of this product under my tongue. It's a salted caramel taste, too, which kind of takes care of the uh, sweet tooth at the same time. So the craving to eat is gone, uh, the sweet tooth is gone, calories, none. If you need a little help battling back the craving monsters yourself, well, you can find a direct link to this CTFO weight loss oral spray on the sponsors page at WeirdDarkness.com. The early 1900s were marred by scores of labor strikes across the country. There was no question that workers of the day often labored under deplorable conditions. They worked long hours in often unsafe factories, and in many cases labor unions were the only relief they had from the greed of big companies who would work their employees until they literally broke under the pressure. But in some cases, labor strikes had fatal consequences, as they did that day in Brooklyn when a strike breaker lost control of a Brighton Beach train during the evening rush hour. The horrible wreck ended with 93 people dead and many more injured. Previously known as the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island Railroad, the Brighton Beach Line dated back to the 1870s. It was one of several steam railroads that linked Brooklyn to the seaside resorts. By the early 1900s, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit System controlled the line, along with streetcar and elevated lines throughout the area. During 1918, the last year of World War I, tensions escalated between Brooklyn Rapid Transit BRT, and the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. At least 20 men had been fired because of their membership in the union. 
the union responded by filing a grievance with the National War Labor Board, a federal review panel that had been created to strengthen the war effort on the home front by improving labor management relations. In late October, the board recommended that the BRT rehire the workers with back pay, but the board had no power of enforcement and the BRT ignored the recommendation. In fact, they even refused to meet with the union's delegation. Finally, a strike was called starting at 5 a.m. Friday, November 1, 1918. The strike crippled the rail line. Supervisors and clerks with little or no hands-on training were thrown into empty locomotives to work as motormen. Among the strike breakers was Edward Luciano, 23, who worked under the name of Billy Lewis to avoid the anti-Italian prejudice that was prevalent at the time. He'd been a dispatcher for the BRT for two years. Earlier, in 1918, he'd received two hours of classroom instruction to become a motorman. Just before he was assigned to a locomotive, he had spent two days riding as an observer to gain practical experience in train operations. Needless to say, this scant training fell far short of the BRT's usual 60 hours of on-the-job training, in addition to a 90-question exam, 60 hours of apprenticeship on board trains, a physical exam, and further testing and certification. After all of that, neophytes would be permitted to take empty trains on practice runs in and around the yards and terminals before finally being allowed to operate a train that was carrying passengers. At 5 a.m. on November 1st, Luciano began a long 11-and-a-half-hour shift. When it ended at 4.30 p.m., he was offered a $20 bonus and the promise of a post-strike raise to pilot a rush-hour train from Kings Highway to Manhattan and then back to Brooklyn over the Brighton Beach Line to Coney Island. Luciano had never ridden on the Brighton Line, let alone driven a train there, but he gladly accepted. A man has to earn a living he later told the New York Times. In the aftermath of the disaster, William Brody, a BRT trainmaster, stated that Thomas Blewett, the BRT superintendent responsible for certifying motormen, had represented Luciano as being properly qualified. Ironically, according to the standards set by the company in the midst of the strike, he probably was. Men with similar qualifications had been running trains on the line all day supervisors decided to take a chance with Luciano. At the yard, he was given a train with five cars attached. Each car had a steel underframe and a wooden body and roof. Four of the cars were at least 30 years old. At 6.08 p.m., Luciano's train arrived at the Park Row Terminal, the vaulted train shed that stood at the Manhattan end of the Brooklyn Bridge. Six minutes later, Luciano began his return trip to Brighton Beach. Charles Darling, a lawyer riding in the first car, later said that the train moved with sudden starts and stops and sped around a curve at Sand Street, the first station in Brooklyn. The train then rumbled on to the Fulton Street elevated line. Walter H. Simonson, a civil engineer who was on board, recalled that the car was jammed to near standing room only. At 6.29 p.m., Luciano departed Grand Avenue for the junction at Franklin Avenue. The switch there was incorrectly set, keeping the train on the Fulton Avenue line toward East New York, rather than turning it southward toward Brighton Beach. After some delay, Luciano managed to back the train up and route it onto the Brighton Beach line at 6.38 p.m. Two minutes later, the train left Park Place Station. As its name indicates, Crown Heights is located atop a crest of land. Between Park Place at the top of the Heights and Prospect Park, the station at the foot of the hill, the track dropped 70 feet over a distance of less than a mile. After the drop came an S-shaped curve that was known as Dead Man's Curve even before the accident. It was a hazardous place where even experienced motormen had to stay alert. By this time, Luciano was probably exhausted. He had been fortunate enough to have recently recovered from the deadly strain of influenza that targeted mainly young adults in the wake of World War I, claiming an estimated 3% of the world's population. In addition to having been ill, he was finishing up a double shift at an extremely demanding job for which he had been inadequately trained. 
His conductor signaled a stop at the next station, Consumers Park, now Botanic Garden, but Luciana rushed through without stopping. Passenger Walter Simonson felt the train accelerate as if to make up for lost time. The next stop was Prospect Park, on the other side of Flatbush Avenue. Luciano found it simple to accelerate the train, but not so easy to stop it. Breaking a subway train safely and smoothly and aligning it with the station platform so passengers can safely board and depart was a difficult task that could only be achieved with expertise. The brakes operated with compressed air. By maximizing the air pressure in the train's main brake line, the motorman had to release the brakes. In other words, he permitted the air to push the brake shoes from the wheels so the train could move. When he wanted to slow the train, he applied the brakes by reducing air pressure, permitting the brake shoes to make contact with the wheels. Air brakes took time to apply and take effect, which meant that trains often traveled hundreds of feet before stopping. A motorman who knew from training and experience how his train would respond to a particular uphill or downhill grade could gauge when to begin braking. Luciano had no such experience. He had never run a train on the Brighton Beach Line or any other line before that morning. At the bottom of the hill, the tracks curved sharply, entering a short tunnel beneath the intersection of Flatbush Avenue and Malbone Street. The posted speed limit for the curve was 6 miles per hour. Luciano later stated that he had been traveling at 30 miles per hour. After the crash, the New York Times quoted a naval officer who estimated the train's speed at 70 miles per hour when it left the track. Many of the surviving passengers later admitted to feeling frightened as Luciano picked up the pace to try and make up for lost time. As Luciano approached the curve, He claimed that the air brakes failed, after which he applied the emergency brakes and threw the train into reverse. Investigators from the New York Public Service Commission and the BRT found after examining the wreckage that the brakes had not failed, the emergency brakes had never been applied, and the motors were never reversed. No one could explain what Luciano had been doing in those final seconds, but it was obvious that he was totally unprepared for the challenges that faced him that day. It was 6.42 p.m. when the train reached Malbone Street and roared into the curve. The first car derailed, ripping up the third rail in a burst of blue sparks. The car left the rails a few feet in front of the opening to the tunnel and rammed one end of a concrete partition that separated the north and southbound tracks. It was thrown at right angles across the roadbed, its front and rear corners crashing into the tunnel wall. The windows of the car shattered spraying glass at the screaming passengers. Packed together in the flimsy wooden box, the passengers were crushed and cut to pieces. The two following cars had swung wider. One of them struck the edge of the tunnel's mouth and ripped along its inner wall, where steel girders that supported the tunnel roof and Flatbush Avenue above protruded from the concrete surface. The girders tore into the car's roof and left side, and it splintered and shattered into bits and pieces of wood, steel, and flesh. Great gashes were cut into the side of the car, which was still traveling at high speed, mowing down the passengers who were standing and decapitating some of them. The left sides of both the second and third cars were stripped away. Scores of men, women, and children were flung against the girders on the concrete wall, where they were either killed instantly or crushed under the wheels after falling onto the tracks. Some of those remaining inside the car were killed inside when they fell onto the twisted iron of the seats, broken timbers and iron beams that projected through the shattered bottom of the car. People standing on the platforms were nearly all killed instantly. One dead man was found impaled on a broken metal rod that had run underneath the car and had snapped, shooting upward at the crash. With an agonizing shriek of metal, the train finally came to a stop. Only 10 seconds had passed. It was still 6.42 p.m. The last two cars had not derailed, and most of the passengers riding in them escaped without serious injury. However, nearly all of them had been cut by flying glass or were bruised from being thrown from their seats. They were packed so tightly in the two rear cars that the force of the wreck was not really felt. 
Many women on board became hysterical when they learned what had happened in the front cars. The passengers were in complete darkness since the derailing cars had torn out the power lines in the tunnel. They could see nothing but could hear the screams of dying and injured in the blackness ahead. Would-be rescuers tried to reach the forward cars and found their way cut off by masses of broken wood and twisted steel. There was no way to get to the survivors who were pinned to their seats or crushed in the ruined cars. Firemen who took part in the rescue work said the second and third cars had fallen over on their sides and the passengers lay heaped together, some dead and some dying, some slightly injured and some unhurt, but all tightly gripped by the wreckage. Bodies were smothered to death, found only with slight marks or injuries. The last cars had survived the disaster and the locomotive was also largely intact. Attorney Charles Darling watched as Edward Luciano emerged, unscathed from the cab. The lawyer asked him what had happened. I don't know, Luciano reportedly replied. I lost control of the damn thing, that's all. Then he stepped from the car and walked up the track to Prospect Park Station. A newsboy waiting for a train who had heard the crash saw a man, presumably Luciano, walk out of the tunnel and wander away. Luciano arrived home later that evening having taken a trolley. Because of the position of the wreck and the nature of the accident, there was a delay in spreading the alarm. Police and firefighters were not notified for nearly 20 minutes. The first rescuers to arrive on the scene found the tunnel jammed with debris so tightly that no crevice or opening was left, reported the New York Times. With lanterns in hand, they began removing wreckage one piece at a time. Police officers and firefighters set about removing the wounded from the tangle of steel, glass, and shattered wood, which stuck out like bayonets in all directions, some of them having already pierced those in the cars, the Times reported. Those who could walk staggered from the tunnel, others had to be carried out. Cradles of burlap were made for the recovered bodies, which were hoisted by the rescuers to the street and laid out in rows before being taken to the morgue. As word about the accident spread throughout Brooklyn, there was little detail about when or where it had happened. Those waiting for loved ones traveling home during rush hour began to panic. When it was finally realized where the tragedy had taken place, a crowd began to gather. Most were there to try and learn the fate of friends and loved ones, but ghoulish curiosity seekers also swelled the ranks of onlookers. As the bodies of the dead were lifted out of the tunnel, reserves from six police precincts were sent to keep order. Ambulances arrived from every hospital in Brooklyn, and scores of doctors and nurses were sent to the scene. As darkness fell on the city, conditions in the tunnel grew even blacker. Automobiles were commandeered and their headlights were pointed at the wreckage. The Brooklyn Gas Company and the Brooklyn Edison Company sent gangs of men with searchlights to illuminate the site. Down in the tunnel, surgeons were working by lantern light, side by side with priests administering last rites. Tens of thousands of people flocked to the police stations and to the morgue where the bodies were taken. The large numbers of those searching for missing relatives made identifying the dead a slow process. Telephone service in Brooklyn became overburdened as frantic calls were made to try and track down loved ones who usually traveled on the BRT line and had not yet arrived home. The wreckage stopped all Brighton Beach traffic, holding up thousands of passengers on the trains that followed. Many of those delayed had to walk long distances to overcrowded streetcars. Commuters arrived home more than two hours late, usually to empty homes. In many cases, their families had become alarmed and had gone to the site of the wreck in search of news, delaying their reunions until late in the evening. In the early morning hours of November 2nd, Edward Luciano was arrested at his home on 33rd Street in Brooklyn. He was taken to the Snyder Street Police Station where he was questioned by the district attorney, the police commissioner, and even the mayor. The young man quickly broke down when faced with such intimidating interrogators and blurted out a nervous story that turned out to be largely untrue. New York City Mayor John Hyland himself, a former railroad man, 
indicated to reporters that he believed Luciano had been criminally negligent. He told the press, this man confessed that he had never run a train on the Brighton Beach line before. He also admitted that when running around that curve he was making a speed of 30 miles an hour. Ironically, the mayor had been fired from his position as a locomotive engineer for taking a curve too fast and nearly hitting a supervisor who was crossing the tracks. He protested his dismissal, but to no avail. The experience left him with a bitter hatred of private rail systems and their owners. When it was pointed out that a sign on the curve warned motormen to go no faster than six miles per hour, Luciano shrugged and had no reply. When he was asked why he had taken a job for which he was unfitted, he answered, a man has to earn a living. He told the men that he had no intention of running away from the crash. He said he remembered nothing until he found himself at home after the accident. He did not know how he got out of the wreck or how he got home. He said he had a vague recollection of having boarded a trolley car but could not remember what car it was. Detectives stated that Luciano was as pale as death when they reached his home, and he appeared to be on the verge of collapse. His replies to questions about the details of the accident turned out to be lies. The brakes had not failed, the emergency brakes had never been applied, and the motors were never reversed. His wife pled his case to the newspapers. Three weeks ago, my husband had an attack of influenza, she said. The next Friday, our baby died. Now this terrible accident. But the general public had little sympathy for Luciano or for his bosses who operated the rail line. Luciano and five officials from the BRT were indicted for manslaughter after the accident. Before the trial began, the BRT's lawyers obtained a change of venue from Brooklyn to Nassau County. Mysteriously, Although the prosecution knew that Luciano had perjured himself by lying when he said he had applied the brakes, that part of his statement was never used as evidence. All cases ended in hung juries, acquittals, and dismissals. No one, including Luciano or the men who put him into his deadly position at the train controls, was ever held responsible for this deadly disaster. The controversy over this disaster raged for months culminating in the charge by Public Service Commissioner Travis Whitney that Mayor Hyland was responsible for the deaths in the tunnel. He said that it was the mayor's fault that the decrepit wooden cars, which were pulverized in the wreck while the streetcars came through unscathed, were still being used. Hyland, Whitney insisted, had done nothing for ten months with an agreement awaiting his signature that would compel the line to use only steel cars. His charges were dismissed as nothing more than political posturing and eventually the finger-pointing faded from the headlines. In December, just a month after the accident, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit line went into receivership. This delayed payment of any claims against the line for over three years. Eventually, the company paid out damages totaling $1.6 million. The largest payout was $40,000, which went to the widow of George W. Holmes, the only railroad worker to die in the disaster. In 1923, the BRT was reorganized as the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation. It, too, went into receivership and was dissolved November 1, 1941, the 23rd anniversary of the accident. After Luciano was acquitted in 1919, he moved and went into the real estate business. He faded from history, and what happened to him after that is unknown. Do you have a dark tale to tell? Share your story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. And if you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron for as little as $1 per month. Patrons giving $5 per month or more become official weirdos and get commercial-free versions of every Weird Darkness episode I post. Patrons at the $10 per month level or higher get more exclusive content such as chapters of books that I'm narrating into audiobooks as I record them, often weeks or months before they ever hit retail or online stores. Learn more on the Become a Patron page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also at WeirdDarkness.com, you can get the free mobile app, find Weird Darkness on Facebook and Twitter, 
Join the Weirdos of Marler House Facebook group, read creepy stories or watch eerie videos I find online, and more. And even more important than becoming a patron is sharing the podcast with people you know. Suggest they subscribe. Whether you use text, email, instant message, social media posts, make a phone call and surprise them because, come on, let's face it, nobody makes phone calls anymore. Any method that you'd use to tell others about Weird Darkness, it's greatly appreciated and it benefits me because it benefits the sponsors and it doesn't cost you anything to do it. And speaking of the sponsors, please check them out. Check out those businesses who are supporting the podcast. You can visit them all at the Sponsors page at WeirdDarkness.com. And if you want to contact me through email or send me something through postal mail, you can find my info on the Contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. And if you listen via Apple Podcasts, that's iTunes, and if you leave a review there, I might read your comment here in the podcast. Got a review from PC0666 in Apple Podcasts, and they said, Love the podcast. I work on a computer all day, and it makes the time fly by. I enjoy the different variety of stories. It's easy to just get lost in the stories. You do a great job. I'll keep listening every day. We all need a little weird in our darkness." And Then I got a nice email from James. He said, Hi Darren, if I may impose and use your first name. After listening to you for all the episodes, I feel like I know you, at least a little. I hope you know how many friends you have, and while I may not have walked in your shoes, I think all of us know someone suffering from depression. For too long, we dismissed them or denied it was a problem. Thankfully, things have started to change. If you stopped broadcasting tomorrow, and I truly hope you continue for some time, you would still be surrounded by friends. We want you happy and healthy first, then you can get off your butt and read more weird darkness and creepypastas. Love your show, like you as a person more. Godspeed. Signed, James Bass stories in this episode are purported to be true, and you can find links in the show notes. Princess Diana, Murder in Paris, was posted at theunredacted.com, and The Malbone Street Disaster was written by Troy Taylor. Music in Weird Darkness comes from Midnight Syndicate, Shadows Symphony, and Audioblocks, and you can find links to all of them in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Marler House Productions 2019. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And a final thought. If you have a hard time believing in yourself, remember who you were before the world taught you to doubt yourself. Don't see yourself through the eyes of those who didn't see value in you. Know your worth, even if they didn't. I'm your creator and host, Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different, or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers, but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. 
Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.